even if they get that through, it will not resolve the problem. And they're not going to get that through now because uh, that's one policy they can't do. That's not going to address the problem of mass unemployment or in the Indian context in poorer countries, mass underemployment because people have to survive and therefore they live miserably here. I can go on and on about other aspects about how the absorption of, uh, of, of, of labor uh, is not uh, taking place adequately at all. The frustration of youth between uh, 20 and 24, 44% of youth are uneducated, you are, uh, of youth are uh, unemployed. The more educated you are, the more difficult it is for you to get the kind of employment you want. So you have an overall 8% unemployment uh, rate in India at the moment, which is very high because otherwise, because most people who are poor are underemployed, not unemployed. Out of this 8%, 80% of it is of young people. Out of the young people who are unemployed, the more qualified they are in terms of education, secondary and graduates, the higher is their rate of unemployment. So this is one factor which has led to a great deal of frustration and anger among youth and the highlighting of the, the youth factor. Hello, hello. Welcome back to BungaCast, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. Today we're going to hear about India's elections. Narendra Modi and his Hindu nationalist BJP have led the government of India for the past decade. Given the size of the BJP and its sister organizations like the RSS, which is a right-wing Hindu nationalist volunteer paramilitary organization, Modi could rightfully claim to be one of the most followed politicians in the world. Over a multi-week election, the BJP had targeted to win 400 seats in parliament, but ended up with less than 300, fewer than they had in the previous parliament. Now, they're still the largest party and will form a government, but nevertheless, it's a setback for them. Shares fell in response, including those of conglomerates owned by billionaires close to Modi himself. So shortly, I'm going to speak to Achen Van Eyck. Achen is a writer and social activist, a former professor at the University of Delhi, and a fellow of the Transnational Institute. He's the author of a number of books, including The Rise of Hindu Authoritarianism and Nationalist Dangers, Secular Failings, A Compass for the Indian Left. Now, Achen was last on in 2021 in episode 198 called Universal India. I personally re-listened to it recently and can hardly recommend it. Uh, this has nothing to do with me. It's just that Achen gives a wonderfully deep account of Hindu nationalism, as well as the erosion of secularism, universalism, and democracy in India. Now, this right here is a free episode, one of two free episodes we put out a month on BungaCast. But for all BungaCast episodes in full, which is about six or seven a month, you'll have to join us at patreon.com slash BungaCast. There you'll find episodes with regular contributors such as Alex Gurvich, Catherine Liu, Amber Lee Frost, and Lee Phillips. I have episodes with writers and editors from Damage Magazine with whom we're partnered. And uh, if you sign up, you'll also get a, a free subscription to Damage Magazine. And of course, uh, episodes with us three Bunga Boys, that is myself, plus Philip and George. Over the past month on this podcast, we've had episodes on Mexico and its recent elections, representing one of the very few left-wing successes in the region as well as in the world. We've had discussions on film, such as Civil War and Zone of Interest. And coming up, we've got episodes on energy utilities and privatization in the USA, gender war and falling birth rates in South Korea, the structure of post-Soviet Russian politics, and much more. So we hope you'll join us. And of course, if you like what you hear in this episode, do make sure you share it, tell your friends, and rate and review this podcast. <laughs> Uh, delighted to have you. 
I wondered whether we could maybe start in Ayodhya, in the Faisabad constituency in Uttar Pradesh, uh, which saw Modi's BJP defeated by a party which I wasn't familiar with, the uh, Samajwadi party. Um, I'm not sure yes. I got the pronunciation right. Could you perhaps explain to us the symbolic significance of this defeat? Well, it's a bit of a surprise because of the success of the Ayodhya campaign, the whole history of trying to uh, break down a, a mosque and set up what is supposed to be a temple to, uh, dedicated to the birthplace, the supposed birthplace of Ram. And they ultimately succeeded in doing so and getting the Supreme Court to actually violate principles of, of, the, of the Constitution uh, in order to justify uh, having that. So they, and they constructed in January the new temple and it was opened up with big fanfare. And yet they lost, although this was the most important campaign that actually propelled the BJP and the forces of Hindutva to prominence in Indian politics. Hmm? But this can be understood in the sense that in these elections, not just in Ayodhya, which is part of the largest state in India, Uttar Pradesh, they suffered a very significant setback uh, in terms of the seats that they obtained. So if you put that in this context, what it means is that, okay, in UP and even elsewhere, uh, a large part, very large part of the Hindu population, if not most, are happy that they've achieved the Ram Mandar, but that this is not enough. There were other issues, and therefore this surprise is part of the more largest surprise that in the most important state, which contributes 80 seats to the Lok Sabha, this most important state, which has been the heartland of BJP support, uh, for so long, is one in which actually they lost to a considerable extent and the party that you mentioned, the Samajwadi party, gained a great deal. In fact, the opposition bloc gained more seats in um, Uttar Pradesh than uh, the BJP, which is a considerable surprise. So I think if you put it in that context, it means that there are limits to how far the, the question of Ayodhya and their Hindutva politics can take them in terms of seeking to expand their hegemony. Okay, excellent. That sets us up very nicely. Uh, I wonder, before we could go into some of the details of the results, um, because of course India is enormous um, and we can't probably do justice to the results as a whole, but we can maybe try to um, gain, uh, gain some sense of a picture of the trajectory, of the electoral trajectory and, and the results, um, which... I guess the, the headline figure is that, yes, BJP remains the largest party, but it did not achieve its target. In fact, it, um, it went backwards. So um, before we do all that, um, the reason that we're recording this in uh, June, we're recording this on the 5th of June, it'll be coming out early next week, is the fact that India's election, elections and electoral process is a very long-winded and complicated affair. So maybe if you could just walk us through briefly uh, how that whole process works and why it takes uh, a number of weeks. Okay. Well, the Indian Union is a union of 29 states, provinces, right? And uh, India, of course, is a country of enormous diversity, linguistic diversity, and even geographically, a very considerable variation. And the general election process has to cover all of these parts usually takes a considerable amount of time and is taken in different phases. You're talking about now the world's largest population. Uh, the size of the constituencies in population size are huge. Hmm? You have enormous number of polling booths. You have to have uh, people uh, manned at all these different polling booths. You, uh, you have EVMs, you have counting and all the rest of it. And therefore, usually there are certain phases in which you take one part of the country and then you go to the other part of the country and then other states and so on. And then over a period of a month. What was disturbing this time is that even though this takes a long time, given that, uh, uh, the, I mean, a uh, time given the size of the country, the election commission has been so influenced by the government that they gave more time than was necessary and they phased the whole um, uh, 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 voting process in ways which would allow the BJP and Modi, which is the biggest party and the richest party, to have more time to campaign for longer in different parts of the country, spend a lot more money and therefore hopefully influence 
the public to a much greater extent than the capacity of the other opposition parties to do. So one of the first criticisms is why on earth, as compared to the past, has there been such a longer term, uh, long time given for that? And why was it organized in such a way that it's more convenient for Modi to travel around and campaign because he's supposed to be the star? So that taking place, and that, of course, was a disturbing factor. The results overall were something of a relief in the sense that this obviously didn't help Modi as much as he had hoped to do so. But it's an unfortunate uh, 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 waste and all. So even for a country like India, especially since it's gone in for EVMs, electronic voting machines, huh, the process can actually be much faster than it was in the past. Although there are, of course, questions that are raised about the EVMs. Incidentally, most countries do not use the EVMs. Uh, the United States uses to a limited extent. A number of countries like Italy and others that tried it have given up on it because it's easier to manipulate the mechanics of it. Uh, and there is, of course, a lot of people in India who feel that we should go back to the uh, counting system, paper balloting and counting system rather than this. But that's another issue. Mm. I'm sure we could get into that if, oh, we, yeah. if we wanted to, but maybe we'll um, maybe we'll move on. I mean, it, a lot of mainstream discussion uh, in newspapers and the media uh, like to talk up India's exercise in democracy. Uh, and for all that, that maybe flatters what, a, a democracy that, as you've discussed before on this program and elsewhere, uh, it's a democracy that's been eroded in, in important ways. It still remains a remarkable logistical activity and achievement to to hold these elections. But they do have this particularity, as you were spelling out, that they're not, uh, as with most elections, a, a simultaneous um, snapshot at a particular point in time because they they're a, a, they're very much a process that happens over over many weeks. So. Thinking about this process, was there any notable enthusiasm? Um, I mean, India is an enormous country, and I'm sure you could probably only comment perhaps on, mm. on a, a part that you see, um, or maybe one state versus another. But was there any particular um, story in the election which stood out for you, uh, any particular enthusiasm for a party or a candidate, or did the elections proceed in a fairly rote fashion? Well, this time there wasn't the kind of uh, enthusiasm that, that gets connected, if you like, to one big issue which seems to uh, uh, enthuse people or influence the way they vote. For example, in the 2019 elections, the, uh, the Modi government was able to use the confrontation with Pakistan, the Pulwama issue, as the uh, factor that, oh, save the country from Pakistan, and we are the country, uh, the government and the party that defends us against Pakistan. And that created a kind of enthusiasm that you could sense. This time, there really wasn't uh, that much of uh, enthusiasm. Uh, it was much low, more low key. And in fact, the overall turnout was somewhat less than in previous elections. So that itself was an indication that. There was it, it was a play, uh, election in which the public came out and voted and expressed itself. Hmm? But insofar as this was an expression of a certain degree of unhappiness uh, with the Modi government as compared before, it's, uh, but not a rejection in the sense that it's still the, easily the largest party in coming back, then obviously this indicates that there wasn't a kind of big emotive issue either way, either positive or negative that uh, was really the strongest factor there. But people did come out and they did vote uh, and did support, uh, I mean, the, their particular candidates. If there was some enthusiasm and surprise, it was probably generated by specific regional parties because in many ways, these regional parties have been the biggest, uh, the, the, the force, uh, the elements that have got the biggest success from this election. Um, and is there, um, I'm getting into it, you know, and getting into the results, were there any of these regional parties which captured or spoke to somehow the way the political winds are blowing politically in any way? Or is this all just very, um, very local matters? More local, but a number of the parties that did very well were parties who don't really have that much of a difference ideologically. They're regional parties. Their patron client relationships, they want to come to power, they use that here. It was not so much their ideological differences 
with the uh, uh, the BJP or, or the other, but it was uh, uh, their opposition, if you like, it's opposing the BJP rather than opposing Hindutva ideology or whatever, mm. and wanting to assert itself that was uh, important, and uh, and a defense of, if you like, the, the regional character of uh, uh, of Indian society. So they were obviously, when you say not uh, local it's not just local there's also that larger element that look we are forces of this part of india and we can't just let somebody else come along and sweep us away from that sense so there if you like is a larger message that the regional character of india is very very important in order to understand the total character of india all right very good that's very interesting also in, in thinking about the, uh, the well the extent of uh, the bjp's hegemony and how far it can go that i guess that regional aspect does act as a sort of bulwark against more total domination i, I want to i could say more about in, that yeah but well maybe, yeah we actually, discuss this more please, later please, yeah. Okay, well, well, I mean, I just um, as a way of, of setting this up still, um, I wanted to, I mean, obviously the headline figure is that Modi has been and, and the BJP somewhat dented um, relative to their expectations, certainly. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, I'd like to perhaps try to, or if you could characterize for us, the way in which Modi has risen as this supreme leader in India. He is maybe by some measure the most powerful or the most uh, followed politician in the world, I suspect, simply okay. by virtue of being the head of the BJP, which itself claims to, I think, have one of the, it be the largest political party in the world, larger, larger even than the Communist Party of China, I think. Um, and I suppose entry to, uh, to, to the BJP is, is more voluntary than it is um, to, uh, to the Chinese Communist Party. There's a discussion even of the cult of personality around Modi. There was one piece in, in uh, Foreign Policy, an essay, in, in which came out in late 2022 by Ramachandra Guha, a historian, uh, who claimed that uh, in February 2021, Modi joined the ranks of Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Muammar al-Gaddafi, and Saddam Hussein in having a sports stadium named after him while he was alive and still in office. So... Obviously, that essay itself um, seems very keen to to paint a particular picture of Modi um, and put him in the ranks of these other characters. But do you nevertheless think that's a, a kind of a fair characterization in terms of the role that Modi has come to occupy, particularly over the last 10 years in office? Well, um, yes and no. You're talking about Modi still operating within a liberal democratic uh, framework of some sort, even though uh, his rise and his process has eroded that very greatly. Uh, but let's not talk about China or, or Russia or Stalin and, or, or, or Mao or, or Gaddafi as operating within liberal democratic uh, frameworks. Mm. Uh, so that's a very important difference in the sense that they're all operating in dictatorships. But here is a far-right force which has succeeded in advancing through the liberal democratic process, if you like, it's similar to the uh, more recent current of the last three four, three, four decades, in which even in Europe and elsewhere, in liberal democratic setups, there has been an erosion and the rise of the far right. But having said that, the far right forces of India like uh, are qualitative, are very different in four respects, if you like, uh, are very different from other far right forces elsewhere. Mm. Number one, which other far right, far right forces, for example, in Europe elsewhere, have a continuous existence of over a hundred years? You're talking about the RSS, BJP, the what we call the Sangh Parivar, the family of associations associated with Hindu nationalism, which uh, from 1925 onwards. Hmm? Whether you're talking about uh, Le Pen or Orban or whatever you want to talk about, you're not talking about forces that have this continuity of existence. The second thing is that when you talk about the Sangh Parivar, you're talking about a force which collectively has an implantation in civil society, hmm, uh, which is dramatic. Over 800 NGOs of various types, uh, uh, civil society associate, uh, associated with them, uh, they, have, uh, they don't keep a record, but the estimated number of their activist cadres is in the millions four or five million, whatever. They have daily uh, meetings in branches, and maybe over 60,000 branches 
all over India in rural and semi uh, and urban and semi urban areas and so on hmm? so that degree of implantation is uh, and in which of course they carry out all kinds of secular activities um, uh, uh, fighting when earthquakes take place uh, providing uh, other support to families and all that are connected to them and so on the only broad equivalent to this would be the muslim brotherhood which also has a long history, except that the big difference between the Muslim Brotherhood and the force of the Sangh Parivar is the Muslim Brotherhood is a transnational body. This is a national body. And because the Muslim Brotherhood is a transnational body, it's much weaker in many ways in its political impact than the nationally focused character of the uh, uh, Sangh Parivar. Hmm? I say the Sangh Parivar, the parent organization of the RSS, you have five all India, uh, what do you call it, uh, bodies of the uh, of this force. You have 35 forces affiliated. They have the largest student union body. They have the largest uh, 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 working class federation. They have so many things are here. The third important factor about the BJP, especially in the Indian context, is that it is the one major party that has never had a serious split. The Congress party has split. Other regional parties split from other socialist tradition and so on. The left splits. Even if you have five people, they'll split into two uh, different forces or whatever. Huh? Mm. This is a party that has never had a major split. The Congress party has split. And the question is why? And it's related to, in many ways, the simplicity of their ideology. If you want to make a strong India, recognize that this is a Hindu India and recognize that we have to unite Hindus and in order to unite Hindus, we have to do so and so, especially against the opposition outside of the Muslim, the scapegoat or whatever. And the fourth very important difference is that if you're talking about France and if you're talking about the AFD in Germany and so on, whatever, the other forces, which may be right wing, which are right wing conservative, are independently and put together much stronger than the opposition in India. So. In none of these parties, Le Pen is not the single most important force, easily the most important national for, uh, force there. In the case of Meloni in Italy, she's not, her party is not the most important on its own here. It hasn't in the last two elections got a majority on its own. Here, you're talking about a force that is nationally the most important. The, therefore, the relative strength of the opposition, even if it's right-wing and conservative, to the far right parties in UK, Germany, Italy, Hungary, whatever, is much greater. And they can work together much more in order to prevent that. So that's also a very important difference. And we should recognize this, uh, this factor here. And so therefore, they have had much greater success in establishing them. And that's why many people would say that they are the most important. The other aspect about the personalization and all that is both related to the fact that what's happened, in my view, is that as a result of neoliberal capitalist globalization, what you've had is that most people look for simplistic answers. What's, what is done, to, done is that it's mediatized and personalized politics. And people vote much more for the individual who represents this or that, and that's influenced by the media. People are not reading manifestos and trying to understand rationality, what's happened. Life has become much more complicated. Huh? And in this complication, in this sense of insecurities, it's much easier to pin your hopes on some particular uh, body and say that this is the way that we should move forward. So this mediatization and personalization of politics has become more and more important worldwide and not surprisingly in, uh, in, uh, in India itself. The era of, you know, politicians having mass meetings everywhere and uh, having their manifesto and addressing meetings and all. It's not disappeared, but it's become much less important to control of the media, projection on the media, and the personal uh, personalizations. And uh, that's something that is going to create problems for, uh, for Modi, which is something I can come back to earlier. As for what um, uh, uh, Ramchandra Goa has said, he's right about the fact that you had this uh, in his lifetime, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the naming of the, uh, this here. But he is a liberal. And the problem with liberals in India, as well as elsewhere, is that they've accommodated themselves to the idea of a neoliberal capitalist economy, mm. where the debate is only about compensatory or disciplinary neoliberalism. So he's not a serious uh, critic 
of what is the underlying factor in many ways, which has enabled the rise of the far right, not just in India, but worldwide. And he is certainly not a critic of the right wing shift of conservatism and liberals that has uh, resulted worldwide and in including India. So criticize uh, Modi and the BJP by all means as severely as you can. But don't let the other political parties uh, on the right off the hook. In fact, in, uh, ironically, even as the left parties, mainstream left parties have moved rightward, they're still much better than the uh, other parties, but you won't find liberals uh, recognizing that, if you like. Mm. And, and uh, on foreign policy, of course, uh, uh, they're all, uh, I mean, that's something we can come to later. So, I mean, yes, I mean, that would be my response to what you're saying. No, I mean, th those are very, very illuminating contrasts and also very much help set the cult of personality of Modi in, in a very important context. Uh, I wondered if we could, just in filling out this picture of, of the elections, how whether you could de depict some way of how it played out regionally and or in class terms, um, bearing in mind that I think most listeners are probably not that familiar with uh, with India's electoral map. Um, but if you look at, I mean, from what I had seen, Twenty nine at the last election, twenty nineteen, was a huge amount of orange uh, for the BJP, and now in certain key areas, it seems like there's a lot more blue than there was previously. Um, I've noted in in Uttar Pradesh, in Maharashtra, I think. Yes. Um, but maybe, but you could probably tell me better what the um, what this picture looks like. Okay, first of all, uh, let's take the class aspect, and uh, the uh, situation class wise is very interesting. Just after the elections are over, there were exit polls. That took place on June the 3rd, before the counting began on June the 4th. The exit polls almost all showed very significant gains for the BJP. What happened to the stock market indices then? They rose dramatically, indicating that the capitalist class, or if you like, investors were very happy with this, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what happened on June the 4th when you had the counting and the indication results showing the hair? You had a very dramatic fall in the stock market indices. So if you like, that itself is an indication to you about the capitalist class being very disappointed, if you like, huh? that this now has got more mixed up and complex and we can't have the same kind of stability for the carrying out of the kind of policies that we want, which was earlier there. It's not as if the opposition parties have that much differences over them, but you can see that there. The other aspect about what's happened on the class level is indicated by new reports by, uh, uh, by the, uh, on world inequality, Piketty and others that have brought it out. And do you know that in the last 10, 15 years, India has become one of the most unequal societies in terms of income and wealth distribution, mm. even worse than Brazil and South Africa, which used to have the positions here. That means, that the, so -called, yeah. Yeah, that means that the so-called talk of, uh, uh, of high growth rates in India and it's going forward huh, has actually meant that the gains have been very disproportionate. And it also means that at the economic level, there are all kinds of very, very serious problems. And that reflected itself in the results um, uh, uh, that took place. India has a uh, election has a first past the post system, hmm? which means that there's always a disproportion between the vote share and the number of seats that you get. So if you have a certain significant vote share, you'll get much more seats than that. In fact, in India, to get a majority of seats, you only needed in India, the Congress, which is the only party before the BJP that used to get a majority sometimes, never got more than, it always got, and when it got a majority of seats, got between 41% and 48% votes overall. Modi, and BJP in 2014 got a majority with only 31% of the votes. And then in 2019 got a majority of seats, a comfortable majority with 37% of the votes. This time it's got 37% of the votes, but has not got a majority. Now the question is why this is the case, and this is then connected to what you were pointing out in terms of some of these states. What has been key for this disproportion and the BJP winning so much uh, uh, although it's vote share, was its hold on the Hindi heartland states of the north and the center, plus some seats in the west. 
Hmm? So this is what it gave it the advantage. Uh, yeah, this is the most populous parts I mentioned, UP and so on. So what has happened this time that explained the fact that although its vote share was the same as in 2019, it suffered a loss, was problems that took place and the opposition getting more uh, in the Hindi, some of the Hindi heartland states, not mm -hmm. all by any means, but in some. That's why the whole question of UP. The other second biggest state is Maharashtra, which is in the West, which the BJP used to get. It's got Gujarat, it's kept Gujarat, but here also it suffered. Hmm? So yes, it got stabilized itself in certain of the Hindi heartland states, but lost out elsewhere. It lost out so much that, of course, its seat share went down, but its share was maintained because it also made certain expansions in the east and to a certain extent in the south. So that's the negative factor that its influence has grown there, but weakened in the, uh, uh, in the heartland states and in UP. And this connects to your first question, that even they lost in Ayodhya. What are the reasons for that? The two most important reasons have been the fact that one, the economic issue, the fact of problems of mass poverty, problems of unemployment, especially for the uh, educated uh, youth unemployment. Huh? And these have been factors that are very important. And if you like, my overall summing up in a sentence, if you like, of what's happened is that this election sh is not a rejection of Hindutva. In fact, the uh, uh, Hindutva uh, uh, or, or a Hindutva-infused sense of Indian nationalism has become a common sense. But, but if 25% of Hindus have been radicalized to an extent that they are solid supporters of the Sangh Parivar and the BJV, that does not mean that they have been successful in creating a homogeneous uh, Hindu community that will always be partial towards them and biased towards them. That's where the linguistic diversity comes in, in which you have many, many regional parties that are also based mostly on Hindus, but of course also on the caste basis, the caste divisions. And also, uh, uh, so the caste factor is very, very important here. The regional factors of linguistic and their own regional assertions, the uh, economic factor has been uh, uh, particularly important. They've set limits, uh, if you like. Uh, I've often said that there have been four dimensions of the uh, Hindutva project under Modi. One, eliminate and subordinate all electoral competitors. Two, suborn the institutions of Indian democracy, hollow them out, control the judiciary, control the election commission, control the permanent government, the bureaucracy. Hmm? Control these in uh, various ways. That, that has not been reversed. That's still there, but the process of trying to expand that has probably been greatly slowed down. The judiciary in particular, the control of the judiciary, they've got it. They've got all these things. They're not, a third dimension, of course, was the terrorization, ghettoization, inferiorization of Muslims. That has also been taking place. If you like, during the Modi period, you don't have large-scale anti-Muslim uh, riots. But you have everyday routinized harassment and bulldozer just etc., which carries on. Mm. And another aspect is that the Modi government has used the uh, services, uh, uh, the, the uh, enforcement directed, the uh, uh, police force, the National Investigative Agency, all these forces of the Indian government, the police forces and the paramilitary police forces and other forces, to go after their uh, dissidents, whether liberal or leftists and all. This is not going to change that much. Hmm? And the last part was the ideological homogenization, control of education, control of the media. That too is maybe slow down, but it's carrying on. Where they've got a jolt and where they have actually failed and matters have been reversed is the first one. The question of trying to eliminate their uh, uh, electoral uh, uh, opponents of various kinds. You see what happened here is that many of these regional parties which had alliances with the BJP earlier on, realized that by having alliances with the BJP, the BJP was cannibalizing them and taking more and more and advancing further. So for their own physical existence and security, not because of very strong hostility to Hindutva or anything like that, hmm? 
uh, or even any kind of clear cut anti neoliberal perspective which they don't have and all that here, they realize that they have to be opposed to that here. And that's an expression of the regional character of Indian uh, society, uh, after all, it's a continent, which means that that is the one area in which matters have been reversed. Not just stalled so they can't expand, but they've been reversed. So the real victors in many ways are the regional parties, politically, electorally speaking. Uh, uh, I mean, there are other things that follow from that, but that is what uh, I would say uh, has happened. The regional dimension and the economic dimension and the social uh, caste dimension have all been major barriers uh, uh, to the expansion. But don't misunderstand this as indicating a hostility of any kind or an organized uh, opposition to uh, Hindu nationalism. Yeah, no, that's I, that's fascinating, um, and you've very much preempted the question that I wanted to ask, which is specifically about whether the results reflect uh, in any way, kind of, uh, a ideological challenge to to Hindutva. Um, I mean, it does. It is interesting that that neoliberal capitalism, while on the one hand it throws up um, these sorts of configurations um, of uh, a certain kind of authoritarian right wing capitalism. At the same time, uh, though they're never able to solidify uh, a block um, which is entirely hegemonic, precisely because of the instabilities of neoliberal capitalism and the inability to truly satisfy the masses' aspirations and, and hopes, um, which seems to be the which seems to be um, exemplified in, in these results to, to to a certain degree. Can I just make one comment, which is a general comment, apart from saying that I'm apologizing for speaking for so long and preempting your questions, but then you realize... That no, no, it's perfect. Are, no, it's also that uh, Indians love to talk, and that's a national characteristic, <laughs> which is a different matter. Well, um, last time you chided me because I said, I said, no, Brazilians also like to talk. You said, no, no, India is number one. India is number one. India is number one. Huh? In fact, I think I told, mentioned this to you that at any international conference, uh, the British chairperson always says that he has only two problems at every international con uh, delegation, how to get the Japanese delegate to start speaking and how to get the Indian delegate to stop speaking. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we leave that aside. Yeah. Your point about the instabilities of capital, there's another dimension. We are in an era today, and we have been for some time, of transnational neoliberal globalization as the form that is taking place of capitalism worldwide, a neoliberal cap uh, capitalist globalization. But it is operating in a, uh, uh, in a world of multiple nation states. Nation states still remain relevant and very important. Why? Because there are two aspects of, uh, of capitalism which are more internal to it, inherent in it. And one is the principle of competition. So competition is inherent to capitalism. Second is a principle of coordination, which is supposed to be supplied by the market. This is not complete. What capital a competition does is that there are not just winners, a transnational winners, there are also losers. The losers do not say that, look, this is capitalism functioning, we must respect it. They look to prevent them losers and to reverse that. And who do they look to? To their nation states. Huh? That's one. Second, of course, is that which is the mechanism that provides coordination when market coordination fails, the 2008-2012 Great Recession. Again, it's the states. And third, a factor, a, me a, a mechanism which is external to capitalism, stabilizing it, ensuring that you have the ne legal ne necessary legal system, you have the system that can, when there are crises can do the macroeconomic functioning, the uh, mechanism that can f succeed in pushing back and defeating the losers and the movements of resistance to capitalism and against its states. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is that the stabilization of global capitalism has to be done by different nation states. And there are variations in the way that nation states do it because different right wing forces having different histories in those countries are going to be seized upon to actually take this uh, uh, role of stabilizing. And so even as uh, neoliberal capitalist globalization is a very right-wing shift from earlier forms of capitalist, capitalism, 
the developmental Keynesian capitalism, whatever you want to call it here, here, it has to be accompanied in order to be stabilized by a right wing shift in national level politics. And this varies from country to country. So the right wing shift nationally does take place. It requires right wing and far right forces in those countries or even shifting uh, social democratic forces, uh, parties to the right, which has also happened here. But there are variations in the way that this takes place over here. And India represents a very specific value. And you can't get away from this variation, if you like, of uh, far right and right wing forces to stabilize a global uh, capitalist order. It's not just the instabilities within capitalism, it's also the necessary support that it must get from states and state power. Mm. Very good. I want to ask one last question on formal politics before we turn to political economy. How do you see the, firstly, the opposition? As you already noted, it is fragmented. Uh, it, a lot of the kind of resistance to uh, the BJP came in the form of support for maybe regional parties. Um, is there any enthusiasm for what the Congress is offering? So that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question uh, is how a, the, the new government will look and and act, and if you you know if you can kind of foresee how uh, the coalition negotiations will go, will there be any kind of change in direction uh, in in the BJP's okay. government? Okay. First of all, let's again, very important. I mentioned about the limits provided by the economy and the regional parties. Let me elaborate a bit more on this. Unlike in 2014 and 2019, this time the opposition parties actually came together. So the fact that you had an India bloc was one of the more important factors and actually leading to the bad results uh, as expect, uh, than, than expected that they got. This time you did have a, a core coordination in terms of seat sharing, who this, that, whatever. And the Congress party accepted, for example, in UP, uh, in which the Samajwadi party was a major party that, okay, you take uh, most of the seats, we will take some. Hmm? So this coordination for the first time also meant that uh, was an important factor. This is a factor that would encourage them to try and remain united, although the only main unifying factor uh, is in fact anti BJP, if you like. Mm. Huh? That's right. Huh? They tend to go along with soft Hindutva. They're certainly not going to challenge Hindutva openly. And in fact, the success that they've had will reinforce the fact that let's not try to polarize this, that. That doesn't help us. The Muslims, in any case, have nowhere to go. They will go to the anti BJP party, which is also true. Hmm? So uh, that's it. So that matter. So this is uh, 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 important. What is going to happen now? The BJP for the first time does not have a majority. It requires the support of two other parties in order to get over the majority mark. One is the TDP in uh, Andhra Pradesh, Chandra Babu Nadu, who in the past has had hostility, Modi. Hmm? The other party is in Bihar, which uh, is the JDU, Janta Dal United Party, led by uh, Nitish Kumar, who in the last so many decades has both supported the BJP and acted against the BJP. Now, these two parties are very important because although the BJP has got 240, it needs 272. Hmm? And therefore, it needs these two parties, uh, crucially, for it to be able to uh, uh, or rather the NDA needs it because the NDA has 293 and it must stay over 272. Therefore, in order for the NDA to exist as the ruling coalition, these two parties are there. For the first time, Modi has to think about how to get them and he has to play the role of something like a supplicant which is totally against his personality and totally against what his ambitions. Oh, we are going to be the biggest party. We'll have two-thirds majority and so on. Hmm? And the history of these two parties there. So one, of course, is that what is he going to offer them to make sure that they stay with them? Because the opposition will also try to woo them, saying that you're also there. Hmm? The other question, of course, is the BJP has the huge amount of money and it will also try to break the opposition party by wooing them with money and this, that, etc. So you have two areas of uncertainty. 
over the next six months. One is the BJP trying to keep these two close to it and having to make concessions that they never had to make before and they're not particularly uh, here. That's one. Second is that there is a, a what it can it do to break the other opposition parties. Hmm? Many of those being regional parties, the Congress is not going to go. You haven't asked about the left, but the left is very small, but the left won't go with him. The regional parties, from their own experience, are now very, very unlikely. Uh, they've, they've been burnt. It doesn't mean that they might not go, but then these are uncertainties. Yeah. And a third uncertainty now is that internally within the BJP and the RSS, there's going to be much greater tension because the RSS was unhappy about the way that the Modi and the BJP were behaving because Modi was an personality cult, this, that, and he had strengthened the BJP at the expense of the RSS. Hmm? And that was one of the reasons why the RSS cadres did not have the same kind of enthusiasm for supporting the uh, BJP in these elections as in the part, and they've lost out, I mean, uh, electorally. So there will be more tensions between the RSS and the BJP, and there are tensions within uh, on a personality basis and so on. So these are all indications that at the policy level, as I mentioned before, there is not going to be any dramatic uh, advance in many areas. They will continue, but certain things are not on. The idea of a one nation, one poll, which was an idea that was put forward. Forget it. Not only do they not have the two-thirds majority to change the constitution, the regional parties are t totally opposed to this. So they're not mm. going to move there at all here. Second, on the question of the national population register and the national listen, I think one of the questions is about that. Maybe yeah. I can leave that for later. When we'll you come to that in a bit, yeah. We'll come to that over there. Yeah. So that means that they will have to go slow. Their control over the institutions of governance and the, uh, pa the parliament, uh, the, the judiciary is there. But will the judiciary and others now, seeing that there is a stronger opposition, be more willing to assert themselves independently? Let's see, maybe to a little bit extent. But what I'm saying is that um, it's a now a waiting period to see how this political relationship between the opposition bloc and the relative fragility of the BJ NDA, how it plays itself out. If it goes in the direction that the BJP is able to get what it wants, then it will go much more ahead. Or will it mean that there's going to be tensions, problems, and they have to sort it out? And what are these? So these are all uncertainties that can't really say. What I'm really saying is that the politics of how now the opposition and the government, the Modi government, try to stabilize itself. And also the question of whether Modi himself can remain as dominant a personality are two questions that will have to play itself out and we'll get a much clearer picture maybe after six, seven months or so. Incidentally, uh, in the next, in the coming period, there's going to be three other assembly elections and the outcomes of those three assembly elections is also going to be important. One of them being in a state that you mentioned, Maharashtra, hmm? Haryana, and uh, Delhi, New Delhi, uh, this thing here. So these are all factors that can shift the, uh, the, the politics. On the question of what policies they pursue, we can discuss that later, sorry. All right, very good. I wanted to turn now to um, some political economic questions. Of course, the international business press is always overheated, uh, talking up India's growth. I think that growth, uh, and India is one of the fastest growing economies, certainly since the pandemic, uh, that has led Modi to claim India will reach developed country status by 2047, which would be India's 100-year uh, anniversary. So I wonder, firstly, how you read that claim. I mean, my understanding is that the what would might have expected in terms of the role that growth would play in leading a structural transformation in the Indian economy hasn't entirely materialized. I mean, if we think about the role that informality 
and agriculture still plays in in the Indian economy. The fact that formal manufacturing uh, has not expanded and and sucked up as much labor as expected. So how do you read? I mean, this is a perhaps far okay. too broad a question, but how do you read the India's explosive growth and and Modi's cl- big claims? Well, all, uh, look, all this business about the forty seven developed economy and so on. Let's take China. China is supposed to be now a major economy, but its per capita income is worse than that of Italy. So it depends on how you understand development. Okay, huh? that's in case of China, and it may have difficulty, and it will never reach the per capita income of uh, levels of uh, the advanced West European countries of the U.S. It will have difficulty reaching that of Italy, and it may not succeed. They have their own problems. So one is this whole question of what you understand by development, and everybody loves to talk about GDP, growth demand, and that's how the indication here. Huh? And of course, nobody talks about the uneven character of capitalist development in terms of this, that, yeah. I've already mentioned that this so-called growth rate has led to a situation in which you have such unevenness. Let me give you one statistic that no right-wing or liberal economist in India ever points out. Hmm? But it was actually provided by Piketty and Size uh, earlier historically about India. And you will be surprised to notice. Their statistics uh, uh, show that between 1950 and 1980, hmm, the annual rate of growth of the average income, the average real income of the bottom 50% of the Indian population was higher than the annual rate of growth uh, in real of real income of the bottom 50% between 1980 and 2015 so between 1980 and 2015 you have an average uh, annual growth rate of india which is higher on average considerably higher in many decades than between 1950 and 1980 but the average annual increase in real income of the bottom 50%, the rate of increase was lower. What does this mean? It means that in the period from 1980 to 19, 2015, hmm, yes, cumulatively, the income of the lower strata rose, obviously. But it rose at a lower rate than the improvement that was taking place earlier. What this indicates to you is that, in fact, there is a whole section in India which uh, has got huge problems hmm, in terms of uh, actual uh, adequate income in a context of inflation of foodstuffs and so on. In fact, India has, in absolute terms, more people who are malnourished and undernourished than any country anywhere in the world. And that's the situation today in a context of overproduction. Hmm? If you now take the nutritional, you see, what's very interesting is that Indian government now moves away from a nutritional-based understanding of what constitutes uh, development right. avenues, right? And by that level, India has very high percentages of people who are still below the poverty line. Hmm? And when you, this is the de- uh, criteria for poverty line. If you add basic needs like welfare, health, uh, uh, education, Social, uh, social security, all that, etc. The situation in India is very bad. So, what do we understand by the notion of development? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, that, that's one answer. The second, what the latter part of your question was about, uh, uh, yeah, uh, unemployment, about informality in manufacturing, yeah. informality in manufacturing. Well, the hopes that India would be able to uh, absorb uh, people. Many people say the only way of doing that is through manufacturing. And we all know that it's the services sectors that have actually been the uh, absorbing sectors. And manufacturing is, as you pointed out, so. So what do they do over there? In fact, one of the problems for economists is that even in China, where its absorption was with regard to the uh, manufacturing sector, they are going to have more problems in terms of ab- absorbing people, even though they have been manufacturing based for so long. And in fact, yeah. the capacity of manufacturing sector to also increase and absorb is also getting more difficult because of a variety of factors, including labor productivity through digitalization, others being a huge problem uh, over there. So even that is not an answer to the kind of situation there. The other part, which is very important, is that let's realize that contrary to what people thought about the progress of capitalist development, 
forgetting that capitalist I mean, uh, supporters are all, uh, capitalist development is always uneven and combined. You now have many countries which, unlike Western Europe and North America, which are advancing capitalism, whether it's in which you will have the persistence of the peasantry. You are not going to have a, 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 a model that will follow the old system, uh, system of capitalist modernization. Urbanization more and more, yes, that's taking place. But what is displaced from agriculture then gets absorbed in the manufacturing, let alone in the se uh, sector. And you will just have a much more smaller and more efficient. Yeah. You are now going to have many people that was going to remain dependent on the question of agriculture and land holdings and all. And even though the Modi government was trying to move in the direction of the corporatization, contractualization and, uh, of uh, agriculture from production to processing to retailing, that was the whole reason for those uh, anti-farm laws, etc. Huh? Not e even if they get that through, it will not resolve the problem. And they're not going to get that through now because uh, that's one policy they can't do. That's not going to address the problem of mass unemployment or in the Indian context in poorer countries, mass underemployment because people have to survive and therefore they live miserably here. I can go on and on about other aspects about how the absorption of, uh, of, of, of labor uh, is not uh, taking place adequately at all. The frustration of youth between uh, 20 and 24, 44% of youth are uneducated you uh, of youth are uh, unemployed the more educated you are the more difficult it is for you to get the kind of employment you want so you have an overall 8% unemployment uh, rate in india at the moment little over 8% which is very high because otherwise because most people who are poor are underemployed not unemployed out of this 8% 80% of it is of young people out of the young people who are unemployed, the more qualified they are in terms of education, secondary, and, uh, and if they are uh, uh, graduates, the higher is their rate of unemployment. So this is one factor which has led to a lot, great deal of frustration and anger among youth and the highlighting of the, uh, of the youth factor. So this idea that India is going to be resolved, and I'm leaving aside the question of the environment and the mess that is taking place in the environment. One aspect which I didn't take up, which you want me to take up, is this whole question of the corporate class. In places like East uh, of India, like Orissa and Jharkhand, they have swung over to the BJP. Hmm? And there, there's going to be more, and the corporate sector is very happy because this is the area in which, forget your forests, forget your environment. This is the area in which there is great mining wealth that they want to go after. And they are going to go after that over here, and that's going to create huge problems uh, and also going to create resistance. So the economic picture in this thing, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous for people to think that India has got, yeah, but that doesn't mean that overall it won't have a very large uh, GDP and it won't have, in fact, in which country has you had a faster growth of, of dollar billionaires, of dollar billionaires? Mm. It's India. Yeah. So on the dollar billionaires, that, that's a nice segue. Some have described the Indian configuration as one of crony oligarchy. Um, of course, India would not be by any means unique in, in having such arrangements. What is the nature of that? I think I understand that in most important sectors in the Indian economy, an oligopoly obtains. It's often also protected from international competition. Um, so you end up with these sort of favored conglomerates. Is that is that sort of the picture mm -hmm. that uh, that you have? And how does that play out? Politically, I mean, is that are they largely speaking um, in terms of these uh, oligarchs? Are they largely aligned now with the BJP? Well, let me put it this way: uh, first of all, as far as the uh, oligarch, yes, you have now transnational Indian corporations. They are operating transnationally as well. So there's been a huge growth of this. Second is that much of the middle business and the small and medium enterprises, right, in the manufacturing sector, are now linked in chains to the larger enterprises. So even though they're not faring as well as the corporate sector, how on earth are they going to fight against that when in fact their chains of their own development are connected in many ways to these different and also from uh, foreign direct investment coming in and all that. And yes, Indian, uh, uh, Indian state is primarily for the Indian capitalist class. 
let's say, yes, it welcome foreign direct investment, they're coming in and all that. But don't think of India as a country which is like a country in, say, uh, sub-Saharan Africa or somewhere else, in which the uh, capitalist character of that economy is really dominated by foreign capitalists or foreign capital. That's not the case in India. Hmm? So I think that's very important to understand over there. Yeah, And uh, 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 second is that crony capitalists are concerned with who is in governmental power. Hmm? And that governmental power also arbitrates tensions within them. They're, they need that support here. If there's a Congress government, they would move towards that. What may now happen is some of the big capitalists, crony capitalists, they've done that to an earlier extent, uh, extent earlier, uh, give their money to, uh, they, they, they spread their money around, even to regional parties, to this, that, etc. That will continue, but they have greatly favored the BJP. And within that group, Modi has favored a certain section, especially that which has a connection to Gujarat. Uh, the Adani, the Imbanis, and others that have been closer to him. So he's built his own set of crony capitalists. The Congress would have its own favored sense of crony capitalists, and you will have others who will be spreading both here and there. So it's really a question of who's in uh, in power. But the crony system uh, remains. The uh, worry now is that the kind of policies that they would like to do for an agriculture, what I mentioned there, is not going to take place for some considerable time. This government cannot now, you see, this is something very interesting with the farmers' agitation. It was forced, and this is the only defeat for Modi, it had to repeal its agitation, its, its laws for contractualization, for uh, corporatization, and for leading towards land polarization. It had to cheat. But it never, that was two years ago, and, and, two, and, and December 21. But in the two years since then, this BJP government, did not address the demands of the farmers. They were waiting for these elections to say win, mm. and then we will go after and push again. Now they can't do that because of the tension there. So this is a setback to a certain extent for the corporate capitalist cars to be able to move in the direction of they wanted, you know, multinational corporations, what I'm talking about over there. In and, each... and just to, if I just to jump in and to perhaps yeah. put this dynamic in a, in a wider historical context, because I, I mean, I think the expectation, as you've already um, referred to, of the developmental process, which sees the peasantry eventually sort of um, wiped out or reduced to a very small rump. And that's something that's happened in, in, in other countries, which haven't. I mean, I'm thinking of Brazil, where, you know, the peasantry really is very small. Um, it, Brazil is hugely urbanized and the problems of capitalist development express themselves in the form of uh, urban poverty and precarity rather than um, so much in, in, in rural form. In India, you su you're suggesting that that will not be the case, that, that no, no, uh, no, as I'm a consequence, there will be, I mean, that this is a contradiction that will remain very much present in terms of the role that the peasantry no. Uh, no, no, please. no, no, no. Maybe I should clarify. So what's happening is the capacity of agriculture, which is only 18% of the total GDP, to absorb labor hmm, is less and less. You have yeah. now what happened is that you had them uh, migrating to the, uh, uh, to the town. So urbanization is taking place, urban precarity through casualization of labor and all that coming from the countryside here. But it's something like China in the sense that the uh, peasantry family and so on will still maintain control over their land which is some kind of a little backup which they cannot do without okay. but which is not enough for them to be able to earn incomes therefore one member of the family will go to the rural uh, urban area send back remittances and that's so much the case over there but they can't give up the land and you're not going to have that kind of polarization and you will still have production of this uh, of, of, of crops and all and that's not enough. And you will have to have the government to, in order to get support, provide subsidies for that so that they can keep going and so on. So it's not going to be like Brazil in that sense. But yes, like Brazil, precarity, the growing importance of uh, the remittance economy for rural families, uh, for rural groups, uh, smaller land holdings uh, spreading out, this, that, landless laborer uh, increasing. Landless laborer increasing and doing work in the countryside, but also coming to the construction industry and services industries in the cities, 
splitting of families, all of these things over there, but not the elimination of land honing peasantry as such, which will still remain large numbers, even as you have all of these uh, uh, aspects. I, I hope I've been able to. Right. Uh, no, that's clear. That's clear. I, I, I had got you slightly backwards, I think. So um, thank you for, sure. for, for being so clear. I wonder, um, just one last question on, on this before we turn to uh, questions of freedom and democracy uh, as a way of finishing up, I think. What kind of welfare measures exist? And I mean, you've already mentioned the need for uh, subsidies in the rural economy. How does that play out and how does that, what are the politics of that? Um, if that's not too too broad a question, uh, I don't want to, Obviously, none of the no sort of um, state subsidies or welfare will resolve the problems of capitalist development that you've already been discussing. Um, but how uh, has the political establishment sought to at least uh, assuage some of these problems? Well, subsidies for um, agriculture will continue in one form or the other. What you have in uh, in India by both previous governments and the Modi government also, which actually carried on with certain. Uh, welfare measures of its previous government, but just renamed them and extended that to some extent. And what have they done? Freebies. Freebies. Cash transfers to women. Mm. Provision of um, uh, gas cylinders. Mm. Uh, other ways of uh, improving the, the, uh, free, uh, free, uh, free um, uh, packets of grain, of 5 kgs grain and all a very large number here but you already have a public distribution system and all this is in addition to, to that to try to at least uh, address the, some of the basic problems that they're having these are freebies they do not uh, they keep things going cash transfers and digitalization for example of uh, providing new accounts is something that is uh, has taken place and has led to some support for for the uh, modi government but they are simply not enough. The likely trend is that, in the light of even these election results, is that more of this will take place. Because people are unhappy with the economic situation. Mm -hmm. But they are not resolving the problem of jobs. They are not resolving uh, other problems. They are not resolving the problems of basic welfare measures in terms of providing a universal, universally available, free or cheap quality welfare services on the areas of health, on the areas of education, on the area of pensions and social securities, on all of these aspects, they're not doing that. In fact, the freebies are a substitute for not doing that and allowing them. Right. In fact, what might even happen now, and you have some right-wing economists talk about a, uh, in the West and even in India, you've had what's called a right-wing form, what I call a right-wing form of UBI right-wing form of universal basic income. Except that in India, the right-wing economists recognize that you can't make a universal basic income for everybody, mm. but we can talk about a target, targeted basic income for certain people below a certain income level or whatever. That, again, as a substitute for not doing things that are required in terms of genuine welfare service for addressing basic needs and so on. Hmm? Let that be privatized, decommodified. As it is, things are really much, uh, it's, it's, India is a really, uh, uh, not a, de a commodified economy in terms of uh, 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 so many things. 80% uh, of, uh, uh, of expenses on healthcare are done in the private sector. Hmm? Most of uh, education is in the private sector. There's, uh, even as the BJP government wants to take over public education, and change its content and all that here. It's pushing and promoting uh, uh, private sector. And uh, the quality is so uh, poor in many cases that even poor people want to send their children to private schools, many of which are also very bad. So you have all of these problems over there. So I will say that the welfare measure, it's what I call compensatory neoliberalism as distinct from disciplinary neoliberalism. And the forms that compensatory neoliberalism take will vary from country to country here but uh, here and the dominant form in india and maybe the dominant form even in western europe and all is a compensatory neoliberalism but not an attack on neoliberalism as such and uh, yeah and, uh, so i would see that as the basic uh, direction in which uh, 
uh, uh, India and welfare and freebies are going to take place over there. Regular listeners will know that we have had many critical discussions about UBI, um, and in particular, being critical of the notion that, uh, or or, the, or its use as a way to actually extend market relationships rather than to seek to decommodify yes, it, them. Um, and perhaps it's high time actually that we do an episode on how this plays out in countries like India and Brazil and various others as well, where um, it it has UBI and similar measures have its adherence, uh, in, yes. including on the right, as you hint at. In fact, there's also the question of whether a left-wing UBI was, is, is something to support or not. That's also under dispute. A left-wing UBI would say that we must have excellent welfare services freely available and, and so on, but we should also have a minimum this thing here. And there's also a debate on the left about that. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm against. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not on Even the, the, the pro you even the yes, even the left even the left wing UBI I think um, my ultimately yes. my 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 position is that if the um, degree of class consciousness and 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 class power were great enough to bring in the sort of UBI the left would like to see why settle merely for a UBI within um, within cap, capitalist and, social actually, relations and I'm inclined to agree with you actually on that even on the left wing UBI I'm inclined to agree I would say that you have to transform socialized property relations and that can take care of so much in terms of free services and various anyway Chika. Very, very good definitely a conversation for another time um, yeah. let's let's move on i, I wanted to, to ask about the national population register Okay. Which I think you believe you've written about it and why you see it as problematic. Okay. The National Population Register, what happened is that in 2011, you had the last census in India. Hmm? 2021, you were supposed to have the census. It didn't take place partly because of COVID, but even though COVID was getting over there. Yeah. It now has to take place. But that's the census. The census gets certain information. And most people are protected in the sense that it's only certain basic information that they have to get provided here. Now, this census is going to be used to, uh, as the way to fill up the inquiries and the data that the National Population Register wants. The National Population Register has a whole series of questions that it will want to ask of the people that it is looking at, which should not be asked because these are very, very personal details and very detailed questions about your, your religion, what you believe in, what's your mobile number, what's your Aadhaar number and all that, plus what were your parents' birthplaces and all that, etc. And this collection of this thing will serve two purposes. One, it will be an enormous collection of data which will help to create a much stronger surveillance state. Mm. Let's understand that. And of course, everywhere, now the attractions through digitalization of every country, whether left or right uh, government or social democratic government, of having surveillance of their enemies, whether they are left, yeah, is such a powerful attraction that we're going to face this problem. At least Europe has some kind of restriction. Generally. India has nothing like that. In fact, they've made the situation worse in terms of on social media having their own facts. <laughs> That's one aspect. The second aspect of the collection of this data will that this data will then be used to be able to <coughs> decide the next part, which is the National Register of Citizens. The National Register of Citizens. Then what will happen is that they will say, on the base of this data, who are the doubtful citizens because you haven't provided the adequate data that we want in the National Population Register. There is no idea. So you are doubtful citizens. So now you doubtful citizens uh, which will include lots of Hindus uh, and lots of uh, Muslims elsewhere, new doubtful citizens will now you have to, uh, this thing we will ask you more to give us real details and all. And if you don't agree with our verdict, you will have to go to the foreign tribunal, foreign uh, persons tribunal, which is set up there, and they will give the final verdict. And if either they will let you off, that okay, you are a citizen, or you will have to then be put into certain camps, internment camps here. You can expect that although there may be some Hindus that will also go into that poor, whatever there's people, they don't like that, 
there will be a disproportionate number of Muslims. Because India is a country in which most people, even at the lower middle class, middle class level, will not have all the evidence, the documentation, etc., of what is required in the national population uh, register here. These people in, uh, in these internment camps, if you like, then become a mass labor force which can be used in various ways for doing various things. It is going to be very difficult to uh, push out or expel uh, Muslims because India does not have extradition treaties with Bangladesh or Pakistan, let alone with Afghanistan. So they can't say you're not Indian citizens, get out. And they're not going to accept them. But you are going interned. You are becoming a part of a labor force which can be used by the authorities in various ways. Huh? And of course, it serves their interest of also moving in the direction of a, this, what the CAA represents and the Indian state here. That is the longer term project. What's happened now? What's happened now is that they can only move state-wise with regard to the population register and the NRC. Because now, because of the results here and regional parties, and all certain states have already said that we are not going to accept a, 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 pop, a national population. They can't say no to the decadal census. But they're saying, no, we're not going to allow a national population register to be carried on, carried out along with the, uh, the, the census over here. And even uh, the parties that are with the uh, uh, BJP, the uh, TDP and that, may also be reluctant to do so because it may create tensions within their own states which they will not want to handle and so on. So in BJP rule states, they may push this to some extent and carry it out. But even this has been slowed down and made more difficult for them for their project of an NRC, National Register of Citizens, which, of course, was the ultimate direction of trying to make this more Hindu and all the rest of it. So that would be my response to the question of the NRC here. But no, it, will, I mean, that... it will carry on much, much more slowly. It won't be completely halted. But there's been a kind of this thing yet. They'll have to see how they will do it. Well, it, it's fright, frightening measures, and as you, you know, the way you describe that citizens might be divested of, of their citizenship. Um, so, I think that you know, the fact that there might have that these results might represent some sort of break on that, I think, is at least a, a, a small thing to be celebrated. I suppose. I wanted to, in the, the time we have left, maybe touch on on international uh, mm -hmm. matters. I guess the the big one is India's position with regard to competition between the U.S. and China and how it's positioning itself, um, how you see Modi, how do you see Modi acting even even now with, with a reduced majority? With the exception of the left, which has got about eight, nine seats this time, all the other political parties, the Congress party and other parties who think on more national or international level, have no opposition to the basic improvement of the strategic partnership with the United States. Even the Modi government will not have a formal alliance um, uh, treaty, alliance treaty. So they can always say that we are not allied to the United States of America. But all of them want a strategic partnership. They share the basic idea that China is the number one problem for us and also the United, uh, and China is influencing its uh, great influence in the South Asian region. And Pakistan and China are getting closer and all that over here. And they are not going to uh, uh, shift from uh, from this position, even as they talk about India being a much more important part and must have the flexibility with this, that, etc. So don't expect any serious uh, uh, halt, even or uh, drawback towards uh, uh, Indian foreign policy by this uh, or any other government uh, there. Uh, on by on the relationship with uh, U.S. and uh, Israel, the relationship with Russia is getting weaker and weaker on two fronts. Hmm? Even though they said here yeah, uh, on three fronts, because of um, uh, recently they were getting um, uh, oil and paying in rupees, but Russia got so much rupees that it has also told India no more. You will have to give us a foreign currency for the oil that they were getting because of the sanctions that the West was having against Russia because of the Ukraine war. Russia was selling more to elsewhere. Hmm? But that's one problem. Second, militarily, from having providing 70, over 76% 70 
of uh, imports of arms coming from Russia uh, about 10 years ago, or I can't remember, 2016 maybe, it's now come down to 36%. Russia remains the single largest purchaser, but Israel and the United States together now account for 46% of arms purchase. Russia is becoming less important uh, materially in terms of supplying arms. Of course, we have have Indian Army, which have armed forces that have those that they need that replace. But USA and the West and France and Israel becoming more important in supplying arms and uh, defense equipment and high tech. Hmm? So that's one. The third, Russia and China are getting closer. And Russia's capacity to act as a restraint on China for India's benefit is also becoming less. Mm. So the whole overall picture is that why on earth should you expect that there would be an effect? And as for the United States, what can certainly happen from civil society in the United States and then with verbal platitudes from the government is, oh, the democratic situation in India is getting very bad, it's Islamophobic. There. But don't expect this to change government-to-government -government relations in terms of uh, uh, that third-rate cynical uh, attitude by uh, the U.S. government, U.K. government. We need India against China. Hmm? Mm. India is part of the Quad. Hmm? We should have closer relations here. Yeah. India will say, okay, but then what do we get more? We should get more out of it, this, that, etc. But those are little quibbles. India wants to be a middle power, but all your middle powers are not going to challenge the big three in any serious way. They can't. China, Russia, and uh, the US. And Russia, of course, in relation to China, is going to become less important. And it's also worried about China dominating, but that's a separate issue. So that on the international front, uh, 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 to your question, that's my response. So I, I had one final question, and I, I note that you were recently embroiled in, in a sort of confected controversy regarding your position on Palestine. I mean, you can make reference to that if, if you wish, but I wondered if you could explain how the BJP sees Israel as an example for itself. Well, I've written is that Israel is a, is, a, is a master from whom the BJP is it can learn. First of all, both uh, Zionism and, and Hindutva are racist, exclusivist uh, forms of nationalism. And from the beginning, after independence, the forces of the Sangh Parivar have always been uh, appreciative of Israel and of Zion. So there is that ideological kinship, if you like, between Hindutva and Zionism. I could elaborate on this, but I've written a paper on this in The Wire, which if you collect, will give you in much more detail both the similarities and the contrasts there. They learn from Israel in the sense that Israel is now, uh, India is the number one importer of arms from Israel. Hmm? And, uh, uh, India, and uh, India is the number one importer of arms from, from Israel. And, um, uh, and they get lots of very important high tech and so on. Secondly, they send their police for training in border management, ground control, and counterterrorism. The language of the liberals and others in India, is that Israel has done a lot in terms of counterterrorism that we can learn from. Nobody says that Israel itself is actually a, uh, a, st a state that is carrying out terrorism on a systematic scale or whatever here. So that's, uh, so there's a lot of, and what Israel has been doing in the occupied territories is also seen as an example for what uh, expansion of settlements or what India and the Modi regime in particular must do in Kashmir. Hmm? And you've had statements by Indian government personnel that have said that we can learn from here, apart from sending a, a police. And incidentally, the agreement for sending police to Israel took place under the uh, Congress government in 2013. It got implemented after Modi came into power. And of course, there's been an acceleration uh, of that with uh, regard to that. And during these uh, elections, uh, you had uh, fast tracking of Indian migrant labor to uh, help Israel, which had outlawed pa Palestinian labor working in uh, Israel. And this is something that Nepal is also doing in terms of sending and Sri Lanka also doing in terms of sending uh, mm. to Israel. So you have uh, that here. <clears throat> the overall attitude, of course, to the uh, here is that even the Congress Party, in the states that it has ruled, has clamped down on pro-Palestine uh, uh, demonstrations. Hmm? 
So it's not as if the Congress party uh, is there. And just to give you a picture of what is the general attitude towards Israel uh, in India, in the last uh, Lok Sabha, I don't know what will happen in this election, but last, there were 37 political parties represented in the lower house. 37 political parties. 29 of, 29 of them never opened their mouth after October 7th, all that, on the issue at all. Forget about taking, uh, saying this, that, etc. About 10, 11, I'm uh, sorry, 8, 9 at the most, that the Congress party talked, the BJP talked, the three mainstream parties, left parties talked. You had the DMK talking about it. You had two Muslim group organizations in Kerala and Hyderabad uh, making statements. Uh, about eight, nine parties said something or the other about this year. 29 did not. Why not? But this is a faraway issue. If we talk about Palestine now, we'll be seeing as appeasing Muslims. That doesn't help us over here. Yeah, why are we bothered about that? Except that's much more. And they're regional parties. They don't have a national, international spot, part of it, or even if they do. So that's your situation with regard here. Yeah. And those of us, and what happened under the Modi regime, of course, is that they really went after uh, uh, people who were prepared. And it's not just them. I'm talking at universities, public and private, and the control of the Hindutva and them, and the fact that the Israeli government is, of course, making its connections with all sorts of universities in India and providing support in various ways, etc., has also made that these universities don't want to say anything about it. If you like, it's another variation of what many universities in the United States, oh, forget Germany, Germany, I'm sure, is just terrible, but at least there's more opposition. And Let's also understand one thing that with regard to opposition to uh, uh, Israel coming out on the streets, on foreign policy matters, you need a very substantial section of a progressive middle class or organizations of trade unions and others to come out in that here. In India, the middle class is so, 200 million or whatever we call the middle class, is so profoundly reactionary. Its position with regard to Israel is not like the position of at least substantial sections of the middle class in the Western European countries or in North America or in Australia or elsewhere, which is why in India you don't see anything like the kind of civil society, big scale demonstrations that, uh, for Palestine against Israel. And those of us that do something and we try to do something, etc., a watchful eye, restraints, pressures, this, that, etc. Yeah. In my particular case, because of what I was talking at a university, which upset them. I, I was getting a certain restraints from the university, but that was more because the uh, government wants not so much to get at me, but to get at that university and using me to put pressure on the university. Huh? Did you better behave and all the government? And that mm -hmm. then leads to the question that is there a strong connection between the Israelis via the Israeli embassy and the Indian government on all these issues? And the answer to that is yes. There's also that aspect. All right, Achin, I, well, there's more issues that I would like to touch on, but I think we'll have to leave that here. Uh, this has been hugely illuminating as, as again, as, you know, as it was last time when we spoke uh, three years ago, and this has been brilliant once again. So thank you very much for, for your time. And, 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 uh, and go ahead and edit it uh, and reduce it to whatever length you think is uh, sensible. Oh, no, it's, staying in. It's, 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 all, it's all good stuff. It's all good stuff, but I, I'm, I, I pointed out earlier, Indians love to talk, but that don't assume that uh, non-Indians love to hear Indians talking a lot. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Well, I, 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 in, in this specific case, at the very least, I have very much enjoyed uh, listening to you talk. So thank you, Ajay. Okay.